Good evening, members, and everybody that's joining us for this evening for this meeting of the Royal Berkshire Fire Authority. I would like to start by confirming that the meeting is being live streamed on the Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service YouTube channel. Following the meeting, the live stream will continue to be available on this channel and is also being recorded by Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Services should there be any technical difficulties. Members are reminded to please keep their microphones on muted and cameras off unless they're speaking to help with the sound quality and connectivity. If you wish to speak at any time, please turn on your video and I will be notified. For the benefit of viewers of this meeting, we will now conduct an official roll call of members by surname in alphabetical order. Members, when your name is called, please unmute and confirm you are present. You have no need to turn your camera on at this moment. Thank you. Councillor Bateson. Present. Councillor Brooks. Present. Councillor Brown. Present. Councillor Cannon. Present. Councillor Dudley. Present. Councillor Gittins. Present. Councillor Helia Simons. Present. Councillor Howe. Present. Councillor Hume. Present. Councillor Linden. Present. Councillor Lovelock. Present. Councillor Mackenzie Boyle. Present. Councillor Minhas. Present. Councillor Ross. Present. Councillor Shepherd DeBay. Present. Councillor Simpson. Councillor Simpson. Councillor Smith. Present. Councillor Stanford Bill. And Councillor Werner. Present. Councillor Simpson. Present. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. We move on then to agenda item one, which is apologies for absence. Chairman, I've received apologies from Councillor Bennyworth. Thank you very much indeed. I understand he may join the meeting later, but at this moment he's otherwise uh, delayed. Uh, agenda item two is declarations of interest. Please can I ask that any member or officer wishing to declare a declaration of interest relating to an item to be discussed at this meeting to please switch their videos on now. Chairman, there are no declarations of interest. Thank you very much, James. Agenda item three is minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, this is to confirm the accuracy of the minutes that were held of the meeting that was held on the 25th of June. Um, if anybody has got a question with regards to the accuracy of these minutes, can you please turn your video on now? There are no questions, Chairman. I will take those minutes as uh, an accurate record by silent assent. The next item on the agenda is petitions and questions from the public. Understanding orders 19 or 25. Faith, can you confirm if any have been received? Chairman, none have been received. Thank you. Agenda item five is receipt of announcements. We've had our Her Majesty's Inspectors of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services completed. Um, they have been inspecting the response of the fire and rescue sector in England to the COVID-19 pandemic. HMICFRS inspectors conducted a virtual inspection of our service in the week commencing the beginning of October, 12th October. I would like to place on record my thanks to the inspection team and to all staff that assisted with this inspection. 
I'd also like to take the opportunity to more widely thank all our staff who have worked tirelessly under extreme challenging circumstances since the beginning of the pandemic. The service will be issued with an outcome letter for the inspection sometime in January and a national report will also be issued in early 2021. I now have an update with regards to our equality, diversity and inclusion at Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service. In June, the Chief Fire Officer and myself wrote a letter setting out the commitments of the service as made in the wake of the death of George Floyd. In the letter, we committed to a series of actions to remove racism and other prejudices from our society. We'd like to take this opportunity to provide an update on the actions we've taken since. We've now refreshed our Equality, Diversity and Inclusion pages on the services intranet, Siren providing more links and resources to information and materials. We've also included an equality, diversity and inclusion section in the shell, which aims to raise awareness of history, celebrate diversity and share ways in which we can all be more inclusive. A collaboration working group has been formed with other fire and rescue services in Buckinghamshire, Gloucestershire, Oxfordshire and Warwickshire, with the aim of working together to tackle racial prejudice and address inequalities in our services and communities. October was Black History Month, and we recognise that our commitment to removing racism and other prejudices from our society and celebrating Black History needs to extend beyond just a month. The service is on a continuous journey of growth with regards to equality, diversity and inclusion, and we believe that the best way to combat, combat racism and prejudice is by listening and learning. If you have any feedback, suggestions for how we can grow and improve, questions or ideas for addi additional resources, please contact EDI resources at rbfrs.co.uk. Thank you. The next item is uh, with regards to workshops to find our next CFO or Chief Executive. As you are aware, the Chief Fire Officer and Deputy Chief Fire Officer will both be eligible to retire next year, one in July and one in May respectively. As an authority, we are keen to build on the progress we have made in recent years and ensure that the service has the right leadership for the next stage of our journey. Therefore, we have held a number of workshops to review our current and future challenges and the leadership approach and skills we will need to achieve our ambitions. Our intention is to use this feedback to shape the recruitment and selection process. I'd like to thank everyone who's taken part to share their views as part of these workshops. Staff that are unable to make the workshops have been able to provide confidential feedback on this process. As your chairman, I believe that our collaborative working style and member officer relationships paired with the immense dedication and professionalism of our teams will make these positions very attractive to potential candidates. We are committed to doing everything possible to ensure we attract and select the calibre of leaders that our service deserves. Over the coming weeks and months, I will continue to keep you updated on our ongoing work to select your next leader. Members, following the service's commitment to the armed forces community, and receipt of the Ministry of Defence's Employer Recognition Scheme Gold Award, we hosted the first Armed Forces Veterans Hub in Royal Berkshire on Saturday the 7th of November. The current COVID restrictive measures meant we had to alter our original plans for the event, which was to hold the event at one of our fire stations. And whilst we weren't able to meet in person, we really wanted to find a way to host this event on what was Remembrance Sunday weekend. I was joined on Saturday by the Fire Authority's Armed Forces Champion, Councillor Angus Ross, and the Chief Fire Officer, Trevor Ferguson. The aim of the hub is to support those within our communities who had served in Her Majesty's Armed Forces and provide a space in which veterans can listen to guest speakers, access support, and have a chat to others who have also served in the Armed Forces. We were very fortunate to have James Sunderland MP for Bracknell 
joined the session and he spoke about his commitment to the armed forces having served in the military for up to 26 years up until his selection as an MP last year. We were also very privileged to have Colonel Bob Stewart MP for Beckenham and former officer in the British Army join us and share a very moving personal account of his time as an officer. I would like to recall my sincere thanks to MP for Bracknell, James Sunderland and Colonel Bob Stewart MP for making time to support this important initiative. I'd also like to extend my thanks to the many charities and organisations that offer services to the armed forces community for attending this inaugural event. The event was hosted by station manager Shay Scott and Shay is joining us later this evening and I'm sure he'll provide a bit of more detail during his presentation. Thank you to everyone who's contributed to this important initiative. We will keep the way the hub is run under review based on the current COVID guidelines. But this is a long-term commitment from Royal Berkshire Fire Authority. The Smarter Working Live Awards will be taking place virtually on the 26th of November. The remotely managed stations and Flexi Duter Officer project has been shortlisted for two awards at the event. In both the skills and succession planning, and workforce categories. These awards aim to recognise innovation and transformative programmes in the public sector that align to the government's smarter, work, smarter working programme and reflect the hard work and commitment that has gone into the project. We would like to wish the best of luck to all those involved in the project. Firefighters at Crowthorne held a car wash to help raise much needed funds for the firefighters charity on Saturday the 19th of September. With control measures in place to help prevent the spread of COVID-19, firefighters welcomed members of the public safely to the new community fire station for the first time, albeit that visitors had to, re had to remain inside their cars. The crew exceeded their £750 target, raising an incredible total of £1,250. I'd like to place my personal thanks alongside you, the members, to those uh, firefighters and the team at Crowthorn for such a fantastic effort and result. The Firefighters Charity Spirit of Fire Awards took place on Wednesday, the 4th of November. Included in this year's nominees was Paul Watts, watch manager on the Blue Watch at Thames Valley Fire Control Service, and our very own councillor, Tina Mackenzie Boyle, former mayor of Bracknell, was also recognised for her contributions. Paul has been supporting the charity for over 20 years through his roles as an operational firefighter and as a watch manager in control, as well as acting as an advocate for the charity. And signposting colleagues to our services, he's continued to raise money through two tuck shops in Newsham Court. We also separately received a letter of thanks from the charity for the fundraising that took place when the then Mayor of Bracknell Forest, Councillor Tina Mackenzie Boyle, led a range of fundraising activities including a skydive, golf day and the end of year celebrations to generate support for the charity. Tina also supported corporate activity and raised awareness of the charity's work. I'd like to place on record my thanks and congratulations to both Paul and Tina. Their efforts are a testament to the dedication of supporters of the charity, and we're grateful for all they've done to support the fire community. You can watch the awards on the Firefighters Charity YouTube channel. Well done to Paul and Tina. Thank you. This year, Remembrance Day ceremonies took place under the government's new COVID restrictive measures. Now, whilst we weren't able to hold our ceremonies entirely as originally planned, we were able to pay our respects and show our support in many cases in the same way. Our teams marked Remembrance Sunday on station by flying Remembrance flags and observing the two minutes silent outside their stations in remembrance of our fallen heroes. Large poppies were also sent to all fire stations 
to put on their fire engines and display our support. Jay Scott, station manager and armed forces advocate, having served himself for 10 years, attended a COVID secure service in Windsor, where he laid a wreath in, mem a wreath in memory of all those who lost their lives on behalf of the service and the authority. Well done, Shay. We also had some pictures of poppies drawn by local children who created an impl impressive display in the bay windows of the new Crowthorn Community Fire Station. Maidenhead Fire Station also followed suit, having some poppies also drawn by the local children to put up on display for the weekend. Thank you to all those attended and all staff who supported our efforts to recognise those that have served and are serving and those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice to secure and protect our freedom. In a letter to the chair, chairs of fire and rescue authorities, police and fire crime commissioners and the chief fire officers, Lord Greenhow has attended, extended his thanks to the Fire and Rescue Service sector for their work during the first wave of the COVID-19 outbreak. The letter highlighted the great work of the sector in response to the pandemic and the latest management committee meeting we heard about the incredible dedication and commitment of the teams all across our service. This included chairing Thames Valley Local Bis Resilience Forum Logistics Cell, which has seen the distribution of over six and a half million pieces of PPE to frontline healthcare workers through to helping our local communities by providing welfare visits to the clinically extremely vulnerable. All of this work speaks to Lord Greenhouse points of recognition within his letter when he explains how vital the support that the Fire and Rescue Service has offered during the National Health Emergency. Lord Greenhow has also asked for us to work with the National Fire Chiefs Council on how we will continue to support local partners, details of which I will share with you soon. That's the end of my announcements. Are there any other members that wish to add anything to my chairman's announcements? If you could put your video on, if you wish to add anything. There are no other announcements, Chairman. Thank you, Members. We move on then to Agenda Item 6, which is Recommendation of Committees. Faith, can you confirm if, you, if any have been received? Chairman, I have received Agenda Items from Audit and Governance Committee on the 30th of July and the 3rd of November 2020. Item 12 um, is the Members Handbook and Constitutional Amendments. Item 13 is Local Government Ethical Standards Committee on Standards in Public Life. Item 14, Amendments to Contract and Financial Regulations. And Item 16, Annual Report on Governance. Thank you, Faith. With your permission, members, we'll take each of those items in turn as part of this evening's agenda. Agenda item seven is issues arising from Audit and Governance Committee. Faith, can you confirm if any have been received? Chairman, none have been received. Thank you very much indeed. Agenda item eight is questions from members understanding order 30. Faith, can you confirm if any have been received? None have been received. Thank you. Agenda item nine is notices of motion, understanding order 44. Faith, can you confirm if any have been received? None have been received. Thank you. Agenda item 10 is our Armed Forces Covenant Gold Award presentation. At this point, I'd like to ask Shay Scott, Station Manager, to deliver his very interesting presentation. Thank you. Shay, if you're there, I think you might still be on mute. 
Good evening, my name is Shea Scott, the Stage Manager for Core Skills and Technical Rescue based in Learning and Development. I want to thank you for allocating time to allow me to talk about the journey the Royal Berkshire Fire Authority and Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service has taken regarding its support of Her Majesty's Armed Forces and the collaborative work that has taken place across the service enabling us to, clar to clearly demonstrate our commitment to making sure the service is accessible to all. We value everyone, regardless of their background, and recognise that diversity makes us stronger. We are all one team, and we're working to make sure that our service represents every part of our community. The work that we're doing here today forms just one part of our journey with equality, diversity and inclusion, and we're continuing to work to enrich our service for the benefit of the communities we serve. Having people from all walks of life brings a fresh perspective, and we recognise the value that that holds. how did it begin? A decision was made at government level to get organisations and businesses across the UK to recognise their support for the nation's armed forces formally. The Armed Forces Covenant was born and consisted of a statement of intent which said, to those who proudly protect our nation who do so with honour, courage and commitment, the Armed Forces Covenant is the nation's commitment to them. It is a pledge that together we acknowledge and understand that those who serve or who have served in the armed forces and their families should be treated with fairness and respect in the communities, economy and society they serve with their lives. The Covenant supports serving personnel, service leavers, veterans and their families. The Covenant is fulfilled by the different groups that have committed to making a difference. These include the Central Government, overseen by the Ministerial Covenants and Veterans Board, the Navy, Army and Royal Air Force, businesses of all sizes, local government, charities and communities. The Armed Forces Covenant also recognises how organisations and businesses contribute to support the Armed Forces. To this end, the Ministry of Defence initiated the Employers Recognition Scheme. The, employers effort, the MED recognises the employers' efforts and their commitment to demonstrate how they have supported and continue to support the Armed Forces and issue three awards which reflect the employer's level of commitment which they wish to attribute to support in the armed forces. The awards are bronze, silver and gold. When signing the armed forces covenant, all parts of Fire and Rescue Service had already satisfied the criteria for the bronze award. In 2018, Royal Berkshire Fire Authority and Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service took the shared view that as an organisation that holds its core values concerning behaviours, equality, diversity and inclusion, you should also look at the percentage of the workforce that served and are still serving their country and who are now serving their community to the same high standards that were embedded during the time of the Manchester Armed Forces. There are obvious transferable skills that Armed Forces personnel can bring to the modern fire service. Time management, effective communication, teamwork, IT skills, leadership, working under pressure, resource management, analytical skills, equality, diversity and inclusion training, physical and mental well-being. Also, the diverse backgrounds which all individuals bring to young forces as they recruit not only from within the UK, but also the British Commonwealth. By encouraging and supporting the recruitment of a more diverse workforce, the young forces can benefit from a host of fresh perspectives and new ways of working. As an employer, Manchester Armed Forces now place a considerable emphasis on how they look after their workforce. In the early stages of their careers, they are nurtured through initial training and onto their trade training. Once posted to their station, camp, battalion, squadron, regiment or corps, development is achieved by using a mentoring system which also identifies potential leaders. Once identified, they are fast-tracked or placed onto courses to develop them further ready for leadership processes within the armed forces. So what do we do? On the 27th of February 2018, Councillor Colin Dudley, Chair of the Royal Berkshire Fire Authority, Councillor Angus Ross, Royal Berkshire Fire Authority Armed Forces Champion, and Royal Berkshire Fire Rescue Service Chief Officer Trevor Ferguson signed the Armed Forces Covenant. Present were representatives from Her Majesty's Armed Forces and also Dr. Karen Arnold from the MOD Career Transitions Partnership and Kate Lowell, who is the Southeast Regional Engagement Director for the MOD. 
by signing the covenant and demonstrating that we support the armed forces by promoting being armed forces friendly, open to employing reservists and armed forces veterans and cadet, cadet adult volunteers. And we were self-nominated by employers who pledged to support the armed forces. We were awarded for this the Ministry of Defence ERS Bronze Award. Having gained the Bronze Award, we continue to look at what we could do further to enhance our, enhance our awareness of how we as a service could also support and promote the armed forces. I looked at how we could further promote our openness to supporting the armed forces as a potential employer. Will Barks Fire and Rescue Service was contacted by Kate Lowell, Director of the South East Regional Employer Engagement Team, with whom I'd already spoken at one of many meetings I attended on behalf of the service at the Royal Military Academy Centres, which was sponsored by the South East Reserve Forces and Cadets Association. From various conversations that took place, we as a service looked to work collaboratively with Thames Valley Police, South Central Ambulance Service, Careers Transition Partnership and the South East Reserve Forces Cadet Association to highlight the benefits and opportunities of a joint working initiative. As a service, we looked at designing an event in which we could all, as a tri-service collaboration, host armed forces personnel from around the UK who had registered an interest and wanted to find out what a career in any of the burden services could be like. Royal Barch Farm Rescue Service worked closely with colleagues from all three Blue Light partners and spoke with Dr Karen Arnold, who is the Regional Director for CTP. CTP are part of the Ministry of Defence and work with preparing Armed Forces service leavers for life outside of the forces. This work stream resulted in the first ever Tri-Service Insight Day in the UK. The primary purpose of the day was to introduce service leavers to the emergency services and allow them to speak to each service and meet personnel from all three services, some of whom were veterans themselves and could relate to the service leavers and offer them a unique perspective of life outside the armed forces. Other work streams we, we have uh, worked on towards our silver award uh, was um, whether we were pivotal in, on the Open Health Day at Commonwealth Barracks, in which we supported the British Army on its annual health day. The day looked at aspects of physical and mental well-being for soldiers of all ranks based at the barracks. Royal Barracks Foreign Rescue Service had a dual role on the day. Learning and Development Road Traffic Collision Instructors, in conjunction with service delivery, supply operational personnel to deliver a practical demonstration of the mechanisms of a collision and what we as a service can do to extricate casualties from the vehicle safely. There is also a chance for soldiers to chat the crews after the demonstration. Secondly, members of our HR and R&D department set up a stall at the barracks, among, um, among much other businesses, to promote Royal Barks Farm Rescue Service with regards to well-being and recruitment. Through our work and high profile within the armed forces community, in November 2019, Royal Barks Farm Rescue Service was invited to the first ever Blue Light Forum, hosted by the Reserve Forces Association of Greater London, to establish a military Blue Light network in the south of England. This network enables organisations to support each other through the sharing of experiences and good practice, add value to the Defence Partnership and learn about how they can be rewarded through the MOD's Employer Recognition Scheme. This forum was the first of its kind in the UK that was set up to identify more effective and efficient ways of working collaboratively in the future in light of the new statutory duty obligations. We also work with SURFCO, the South East Regional Forces Cadets Association, they provide enduring, efficient and effective support to the Reserve Forces cadets through recruiting, employer and infrastructure support and by fostering and development links with the community. All Barks Fire and Rescue Service fully support this and have supported units of both reserves and their full-time colleagues with bespoke training events which have enabled Royal Barks Fire and Rescue Service to build an excellent working collaborative relationship. I've also attended events held at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst on behalf Royal Barks Fire and Rescue Service alongside Councillor Ross, the Royal Barks Fire Authority Armed Forces Champion, which has hosted biannual award ceremonies to celebrate the achievement of reserves and cadets in the South East. This is also a great chance to further enhance Royal Barkshire Fire and Rescue Service's profile within the South East region and shows our continued support for the Armed Forces. Another work stream was Survive the Drive, a joint Fire and Rescue Service military initiative relating to road safety. Survive the Drive was developed by a host of organisations including Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue Service, Dorset and Wiltshire Fire and Rescue Service and now Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service. It compromised a mix of films featuring armed, armed service personnel who have been involved in road traffic collision 
as well as live speakers who share their own experiences. Topics covered during the session include driving while tired, drink driving, using mobile phone, speeding, and obviously not wearing a seatbelt. Other ongoing work streams we work on, uh, we work at the uh, RF Holton Leadership Command and Control, where we have sent all Barclays Fire and Rescue Service officers to attend their uh, specific uh, command and control courses. We also sent our casualty care instructor in the service to the Joint Medical School to attend the Batterfield Advanced Trauma Life Support course. Also, Remembrance Sunday at the Cenotaph. Since 2016 onwards, we've been sending members of our services to the civilian service contingent to take part at the Cenotaph. Also, Armed Forces Day. Two minute silence, flag flying, and attend memorials all over all Berkshire by personnel from the service. We also have the Remembrance Day two minute silence. We also have Reserve Forces Day, which is held on June the 21st every year which celebrate the contribution and sacrifice that reserves make to our country. Lastly, one, of the, one that we did outstanding for me was laying the wreath from Royal Barch Fire Rescue Service alongside former ACFO Jeffries. We laid it at the Menine Gates in Ypres in Belgium to remember the fallen heroes of World War I and in particular members of the Royal Berkshire Regiment. All of this work culminated in Royal Barch Fire and Rescue Service being awarded the Ministry of Defence ERS Silver Award in 2019. The award ceremony was held on board HMS Victory, the flagship of the Royal Navy, launched in 1765 and was home to Lord Nelson, who commanded the Royal Navy in the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. And I was very privileged and honoured to receive the award on behalf of our property and its service. At such prestigious and world famous locations. Once we've received this award, my focus looked at what more we could do to continue to demonstrate our support for the armed forces. The ERS Gold Award criteria looked at all of our work streams and had other additional measures which we had to achieve to be eligible and to be nominated by our Royal uh, Regional Employment Engagement Director, Kate Lowell. As an employer, Royal Barch Fire and Rescue Service proactively engaged with the Career Transition Partnership in supporting service leaders. Royal Barch Fire and Rescue Service must employ at least one individual from the Armed Forces Community category that the nomination emphasises. For example, one employer nominated for support to the reserves must employ at least one reservist. We also actively ensured that our workforce was aware of their positive policies towards defence pe people issues. For example, our new uh, reserve forces uh, policy was, re was rewritten and uh, enhanced with additional leave for reservists and cadet adult volunteers. Regarding what reservists were able to demonstrate support to mobilizations clearly and have a framework in place to support reservists on the return for mobilization corporations on behalf of Manchester Armed Forces. The work carried out was a truly collaborative effort involving a wide range of individuals and groups from across the service. It was with great pride and honour that Royal Barch Fire and Rescue Service received communications from the Ministry of Defence on 12th of October that we have been awarded the prestigious ERS Gold Award. This year, out of 120 organisations across the UK who had signed the Armed Forces Covenant, only three were Fire and Rescue Services. Royal Barch Fire and Rescue Service was the only Fire and Rescue Service to receive the award first time and we received positive feedback from the awarding body and its panel stating that Royal Barks Fire and Rescue Service had provided strong evidence that has stood out amongst other nominees during the selection process. Royal Barks Fire and Rescue Service have worked hard to achieve so much in only three years and it would not have been happened without the support of the Fire Authority and the senior leadership of Royal Barks Fire and Rescue Service. So what's next? As we stated in our nomination for the Gold Award, this was not the end. So what are we going to do to continue our work? Royal Box Fire and Rescue Service has launched its Armed Forces Military Hub initiative on the 7th of November this year. The Military Veterans Forces Hub initiative will support those within our communities who have served in Her Majesty's Armed Forces. And we hope that this hub will provide a space in which veterans can listen to guest speakers access support and have a chat to others who's also served in the armed forces. The hubs will put fire stations at the heart of the community and allow us as an organisation to have a positive impact on the armed forces veterans community. 
by allowing veterans, their organisations, charities, support groups and associations access to our stations and meeting with our workforce, some of whom are veterans themselves, we are further promoting our core values and advocating our commitment to equality, diversity and inclusion within the community we serve. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much indeed, Shay. Fantastic presentation. Um, members, do you have any questions uh, with regards to the um, presentation that uh, Station Manager Scott has just given us? If you could switch your video on now, please. Uh, Chairman, uh, Councillor Angus Ross would like to speak. Councillor Ross. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. It's not so much a question, but um, uh, we've just received a very full explanation of all the activity that's gone on. And as an ex-serviceman myself, I just want to say how proud I am for the efforts of the many members of staff, especially Chay Scott, who masterminded this process from our start through bronze, silver and now gold for the employer's recognition scheme. Uh, we have over 30 members of staff within the brigade who are ex-service people, and I'm sure that will increase over the time. And we're committed to continue our work with retiring servicemen as well as supporting service veterans, as both the presentation and you, yourself, Chairman, mentioned earlier. And I look personally forward to supporting this going forward wherever I can but it's really to say well done to all those who are involved. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Ross. Does any other member wish to speak? Chairman, the Vice Chairman, Councillor Hillier Simons would like to speak. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you very much. Che, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you ever so much for putting it together. It was really fascinating and particularly to see the history of how we've got to a gold and so quickly as well. I'd just like to add my thanks to Councillor Ross's because it takes a lot of time and effort to um, get a, an award of this nature and to get it for the first time of trying absolutely astounding. So well done to you and everybody else that's been part of all of this. Um, in respect of future recruitment, I would imagine that having this gold award would attract even more former military people to the fire service. So I think it's going to be worth its weight in gold, shall I say. But thank you so much for everybody that's taken part in achieving this and, and for the presentation this evening. Thank you, Vice Chair. Is there any other member wish to speak? Councillor Shepherd Dubay would like to speak, Chairman. Councillor Shepherd Dubay. I would also like to con congratulate the people who have managed to do this to get us this award. I'm also a veteran as well, and respect everybody who has fought for Queen and Country and what they're doing. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other members wish to speak? No one else wishes to speak, Chairman. OK, well, thank you very much indeed. Shay, can I just add other members' congratulations for the work that you're doing to uh, to lead this and coordinate our our response and our and our efforts to support Her Majesty's, Her Majesty's military veterans and current serving reservists. Um, I was I was pleased and proud to be able to uh, part host the uh, Veterans Hub uh, on Saturday the 7th. Uh, it was it was a fantastic event. I'm only sorry we couldn't do it physically, but we had to do it virtually. Uh, but both the Chief and I uh, were on that at Veterans Hub, along with Councillor Ross. Um, and I was amazed at the amount of charities and organisations there are around Berkshire and the UK that are supporting our military vet veterans. Um, and to continue this uh, is, can only be a good thing. I was also really, really pleased that one of our local MPs, uh, James Sunderland MP for Bracknell Forest, 
uh, was able to come on and say a few words as an ex-military man himself. Um, and, and I'm sure that as soon as we can safely hold these military hub meetings, uh, we, you know, it'll be really, really great to meet some of these veterans in person. So thank you very much, Shay. Um, thank you very much, Angus, for the work that you do as our champion. And thank you to all of the staff that have worked so hard in Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service to make this a success. Well done. Thank you. Um, we'll now move on to agenda item 11, which is the Fire and Rescue Insurance Company presentation. Um, I'd like to invite Trevor Ferguson, Chief Fire Officer, to deliver the presentation, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think someone should have maybe looked at the ordering of this, uh, given the excitement and the glamour of the presentation which Shay has given about the great work to support our military veterans. I now get to speak to members about insurance and risk management, uh, which I'm sure will be the highlight of uh, this evening's meeting. So I think brevity will probably be uh, the key to the presentation which I will give you. Uh, Jim, if you could just move to the next one. Uh, why we wanted to bring this back to members, uh, this is actually a very innovative and successful piece of work that this fire authority was one of the founding members in, uh, and it has grown uh, from success to success over the last few years. And we thought given the change in members, some members probably even aren't aware that you are an owning shareholder in the Fire and Rescue Service Indemnity Company. So we're going to give you a small uh, overview of what the frick is a little bit about the ethos, how it works, and then a little bit about how it's performing afterwards. Uh, so we'll just move on to the next slide. So what is Frick? Uh, so the wording in this slide has been very carefully chosen as Frick is regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, and I just need to clarify that I'm not trying to sell you anything at this point, just highlighting the work of Frick. So it's a hybrid discretionary mutual. So it's a blend of discretionary protection for expected losses and contractual insurance for big losses. Um, we'll work out in a little bit more detail if we can bring that actually into uh, more lay terms in the next few slides. But essentially what it has been, it has been a long-term partnership between a range of forward-thinking fire authorities with a view to collectively purchasing insurance, but more importantly, to reducing their risk by sharing learning and also to dealing with claims effectively. So therefore that we can reduce the costs of claims to the authority. Uh, as members know, it's public money we're dealing in and we're very keen to make sure we deal with that money as efficiently as possible. And we would much prefer that the money returns to the shareholders of the fire authority rather than other shareholders for profit. So what is the background for some members on the fire authority who are here for their first or their second time may remember Framel, which was the first version of Frick, and that was formed in 2006 by nine authorities. Uh, some changes in legislation and some legal challenges from within the insurance industry resulted in this discretionary mutual model being founded in 2015. Uh, and that was when the Fire Authority became a founding stakeholder in it. Uh, the National Fire Chiefs Council recognised Frick as best practice in 2017. And since we introduced another two members in 2019, with another member coming forward to make us 12 now. Uh, also in 2019, HMICFRS uh, highlighted this as an excellent example of collaboration and recognition. Thank you, James. And the recognition of this very innovative piece of work by the Fire Authority didn't just end with the National Fire Chiefs Council or indeed HMIC FRS. Luke Edwards, the Director for Fire Policy in the Home Office, has been very supportive. Uh, and you will see before you his comments in relation to it and his understanding and his questioning of other fire authorities as to why they aren't a partnership of this forward-looking, collaborative and innovative project. And therefore, we hope that we'll continue to grow in the years ahead. So what is the ethos? And this is a very key point in relation to the ethos about it being a collaborative uh, mutual. It's based on trust, honesty, openness and transparency. Uh, technically, the requirement for all claims to be paid is at the discretion 
of the board of Frick, but given that the board are members of the various fire authorities who owned it, that trust and honesty has led to a very profitable and uh, a very advantageous relationship across all of the services. And it's not just about insurance, even though the Fire and Rescue Service and Demony Company does collectively buy insurance on behalf of all members. It's really about thinking about risk reduction. And there are a range of work streams where we work collectively to think about how can we reduce claims? How can we align our driver policies? Uh, and we'll touch a little bit more on that later as to how we try and do that. We also want to make sure that we handle claims really efficiently because inefficient handling of claims can lead to additional legal costs and additional costs. And all of this is to ensure that we ultimately meet that goal of doing what we are all here to do and get the best results possible for the public purse. And the good thing, which we shall touch on at the end when Connor uh, speaks about the finances of Frick, uh, any profits or any money left at the end of the year in relation to it doesn't go to shareholders, but it's held on behalf of the member fire authorities who are ultimately the shareholders and can be potentially redistributed at some point in the future. Thank you, James. So this is how now I try and simplify into lay terms about what we actually try and do. So in very simple terms, all members, um, based on some quite um, specific calculations, put together their contributions and they are held in a pot um, Frick purchases insurance for any big high value claims that would be beyond that pot that we hold our, um, shall we call them premiums in. And then out of the lower value claims, the small bumps and accidents which would result in from day to day, those are settled by Frick on behalf of the member uh, out of that pot of money. And by managing the claims really effectively and really efficiently and driving down costs, then we end up at the end of the year with a surplus, hopefully. And Connor will <coughs> touch a little on that. So when that pot isn't fully used at the end of the year, the benefits are returned to members, not shareholders. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide, James, please. So as I say, to try and reduce risk is the best thing, because rather than having any claim at all, we would like to reduce that. So in addition, a, a fundamental part of Frick is FARG. So that's the Fire and Rescue Service Risk Group. And this is where people come together, talk about driving policies, talk about how we manage reversing, talk about how we maintain our premises, and also look at things like accidents on duty and how can we reduce claims. And ultimately with the view to be that we reduce claims, find themes which are constant across the services, share best practice and share learning therefore reducing the overall outlay which is required and saving money for the shareholders, ultimately the fire authority. We can move on to the next slide. Jim. So how does the governance work in relation to it? Well, there is a board of six directors with an independent chair. Uh, until quite recently, uh, I was a director of this. Um, Connor is still a director and directors are drawn from all of the member authorities. So each of those authorities who own a share Put forward directors and they manage the company on behalf of the authorities. Frick then employs a mutual manager who are a specialist company with specialism in relation to managing mutuals and who know the insurance industry. The one we employ is called Regis and Regis manage the day-to-day -day business from purchasing our insurance, managing our claims and keeping our costs low to make sure that we can return a, a surplus at the end of the year to members. And the Frick board and indeed Regis on our behalf ensure that we comply with all the legal requirements for our procurement, but also, as I say, the FCA, Financial Conduct Authority requirements, as they, this is a regulated sector. Uh, it has been recognised quite significantly, 2016, 2017 is a very innovative and, and also in relation to our work to reduce risks. So I think it's something that members and indeed this authority can be really proud of because of their very early participation and indeed without their investment in, and the initial formation of this, it wouldn't have happened. So probably the part that members will be most interested in, uh, I will hand over to my uh, learned colleague, Connor, who will give you a little bit of a detail on where we are in relation to the numbers and, and how that has worked for us since 2015 when Frick was formed. Thank you. 
Thank you, Trevor. Um, as you can see from the slide, uh, total member contributions are around four million pounds per annum. And um, Frick has generated a surplus each year since its inception. And uh, these surpluses can be returned to members. Up to this point, Frick has built up these surpluses in its reserves. And these currently stand at £950,000 um, at the end of the 2018-19 year. Um, the Frick financial years run from November to October. Should um, prior year surpluses be distributed to member authorities in the future, only fire authorities that were members in those particular years will be entitled to receive a share. And this ensures that the distribution of surpluses is linked to member performance. At the end of 2018-19, um, Frick had set aside nearly £2.7 million as a provision for claims incurred but not yet reported. This figure is calculated by an actuary on a prudent basis and is based on potential claims that could still arise from prior years. The actuary reviews this provision on a regular basis and whilst to date some of this provision relating to early years has been released to reserves, it is possible that in the future additional provision may need to be set aside if actual claims turn out to be higher than the actuarial forecast. Over the long run, it is expected that uh, the continued focus on risk management by member authorities will contain the volume and magnitude of claims and thus lead to cheaper protection than what would otherwise be the case with standard um, insurance arrangements. That said, the nature of the risks that we're seeking to cover is that short-term volatility is to be expected and there will therefore be variability in the performance of RIC from year to year. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed, Connor. Um, I'm going to kick off the questions, and, and if any a member has got a question, I'll give you a chance to now put your video on. Uh, but I'm going to ask, ask the first one. Um, Connor or Trevor, uh, can you tell me, obviously the, the Frick has grown from its membership uh, since its inception. Um, do you find that the more members, member fire authorities or member fire services we have, um, the better the uh, the chances of a surplus at the end of the year, or doesn't that necessarily follow? Uh, I'll take that, Chairman. Yes, in principle, if we go to the very ethos of where insurance grew from and the, the wider the risk is spread amongst the group, the more likely it is that you will um, avoid a black swan event and have one Thing which causes significant risk and and ideally the the market for the frick should be probably all combined fire authorities and perhaps some of the smaller metropolitans and that would give us a very healthy group within which to uh, share that profit because ultimately um, we are in a market where private insurers are selling insurance and paying shareholders and they wouldn't be doing that unless there was a, a market for profit at the end of the day Thank you. And one for you, Connor. Um, without obviously within that, I think it was nearly four million pounds that um, contributions that were put into the frick. Some of that would have been would have been ours. Um, how much would you say that we are currently saving on insurance premiums by being in the frick? Um, that, that's that's quite a difficult question to answer because. Um, the insurance market is, is continually changing. Um, and I know that uh, when we first set up the Frick in 2015, um, insurance companies were quite um, keen to offer um, very good um, rates um, to fire and rescue services not to join the Frick. Um, but we, we believe that um, over the long run, we will save um, substantial um, sums of money um, that, uh, basically relies on the fact that we don't have any major claims um, that, that obviously um, could be uh, very detrimental to um, the financial position of Frick. Um, but if we avoid that, um, we believe that um, as Frick grows with new members, um, those surpluses will be there and they will be um, able to be returned to um, member fire and rescue services. Um, and obviously that wouldn't be the case if we were just um, purchasing um, 
insurance, um, those surpluses would remain with the insurance companies. But I think the, the other important thing, which Trevor has also highlighted, is that there's a huge emphasis really on risk reduction. And if we're all with individual insurance companies, um, there isn't the same incentive to uh, reduce risk and reduce claims because the link between claims and um, our policy premiums um, is, is not clear. So um, in the past, we've, we've uh, said that we've got very good claims record. Why is it that our, our, our premiums keep going up? And um, it's always um, based on market conditions. And so with the FRIC, we're in control of that. We know exactly what our claims are. We know what the surpluses are. It's all very transparent. And the, the main, the real driving force behind FRIC is to reduce um, those incidents of claims, um, because obviously that's in everyone's interest and um, financial position then follows on from that. Thank you, Connor. I think we can all relate to premiums going up every year. Um, okay. Uh, does any member does any member have a question? Okay. Was, sorry. Sorry, Chairman. There are no other questions. Okay. Chairman Councillor Smith would like to ask a question. Okay. Councillor Smith. Uh, sorry, Chairman. I, I obviously came in just a bit late there. I I, I just want to uh, clarify for transparency uh, the sort of claims. Uh, sorry, the sort of items that we're insuring um, would they be things like um, our vehicles and um, the the fire stations, property. And, and even perhaps um, against accidents involving firefighters and so on. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Yes, that's exactly right. Three main areas of claim. So you have your vehicles, you have your buildings, and you have your uh, public and employer liability. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Any other member? Does any other member wish to speak? Okay, thank you very much indeed. We'll then move on. James, I understand you've just got something to do before we move on. Yes, Chairman. Um, we're just going to conduct another roll call um, as Councillor Bennyworth has joined, we believe. Just for Councillor Bennyworth. Ch Councillor Bennyworth, could you please turn on your video and audio just to make sure we can hear you properly? Good evening, everyone. Apologies to my tiny uh, parents. It's nice to be here. Thanks very much, Councillor Bennyworth. Welcome, and uh, I hope you've had a safe journey. Agenda item 12 is Members' Handbook and Constitutional Amendments. And please can I ask Councillor Mackenzie Boyle to introduce this item. So if you could put your video and camera, uh, video and microphone on. Please, Councillor McKenzie Boyle. It's you, you, you coming on now. I think it's coming on now. There we are. Yeah, okay. thank, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm pleased to introduce the agenda item as uh, Chairman of the Audit and Governance Committee. Members may recall that in January 2020, the internal auditors gave the authorities substantial assurance on risk management and go governance. The proposed revisions to the Members' Handbook includes the two low priorities identified in the auditors' findings and make other amendments aimed at making the procedures more inclusive and accessible in line with the authorities' equality, diversity and inclusive inclusion objectives. The Audit and Governance Committee considered the Office's recommendation at its meeting on 30th of July and unanimously endorsed them. So please, can I ask Graham Britton, please, the Monitoring Office, to present the report? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Members. The purpose of this report is to, to seek the authority's approval to agree changes to its suite of constitutional documents that comprise what is known as the Members' Handbook. The recommendations are enumerated as 2.1 to 
at page 23 in your agenda pack. I would like to thank Faith Rowe for pulling the strands of this report together for me. As mentioned by Councillor Mackenzie Boyle, in January 2020, the internal auditors gave the authority substantial assurance on risk management and governance. The proposed revisions to the Members' Handbook include amendments made to address the two low priorities identified by the auditors in their findings. First, a recommendation to insert into each of the Standing Committee terms of reference the appointment of Chairman and Vice-Chairman at their first meetings of the year, and secondly, that the constitutional documents include a reference within them that they are subject to a review period. As stated at paragraphs 3.7 and paragraphs uh, 5.1 in the report, the remaining documents in the Member's Handbook, namely the financial and contract regulations, will be addressed in a later agenda item this evening. Paragraph 3.8 summarises the changes made to the relevant sections of the Handbook. Paragraph 3.8 is at pages 24 and 25 of the agenda pack. Finally, if I take members back to the recommendations, recommendations 2.5 on page 23 derives from a decision taken by the authorities management committee at its 21st July meeting in connection with the leadership succession planning. The proposed changes reflect the management committee's intention that the authority should accommodate either a chief fire officer or a non-operational chief executive as its head of paid service. Um, Chairman, I don't propose to take uh, a members through the, uh, the substance of the recommendations uh, in detail, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Graham. Um, can I ask that if any other member wishing to ask questions, can you please switch your video on? Chairman, uh, Councillor Ross and Councillor Brooks would like to ask a question. I believe Councillor Ross was first. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Sorry, Councillor Ross, you're still on mute. My apologies. Uh, Chairman, sorry, I've got two questions. Uh, okay, just hold on, Councillor Ross. We've got somebody else has got their. Um, that's better. Uh, oh, that's lovely. All right, Councillor Ross, please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first, uh, looking at page 30, uh, the appointments to uh, standing committees, lead members and member champions, uh, would it be appropriate, uh, as I get, get to call the armed forces champion, that that is recognised or is this just a sort of casual appointment? Uh, the second question, on Appendix D, Understanding Orders, Petitions, I'm just concerned and, and wonder whether it was considered that if petitions only came to the fire authority, this could lead to an excessive period of time before a petition was considered uh, and responded to. Thank you. Um, Graham, would you like to answer those? Certainly, and, and thank you for the questions. Um, in respect of your, or the position of um, armed forces champion, I'm. I'm actually um, not familiar with the manner in which you're currently appointed to that role. My understanding is that um, it may be more of a casual appointment. Uh, I, I don't think I was necessarily present at the authority meeting where that appointment was made, but I could probably um, take guidance from colleagues in the room about when that uh, appointment was made. Or, other, or alternatively, we, there, we can uh, formalise it uh, as an authority uh, appointment. I'm not sure how it came about, to be honest. Uh, okay, just hold on. I'm just having a discussion with officers and I'll come back and answer your question, Angus. Hold on. Okay. Um, look, uh, there's there's some discussion about whether we can make actually formalise this. Uh, my, my my preference would be to formalise it, but there are other implications that um, 
that are in that. So would you mind very much if I took that offline and come back to you, Angus, and then report back at the next fire authority meeting? No problem, Chairman. Thank you. Um, and what was the other question you had? About potential delays in petitions being considered if they only came to fire authority meetings. Okay. Would you like to take that one, Graham? Um, there, there, thank you for that question as well, Councillor Ross. I mean, there would be a delay, but um, the idea of them coming uh, to the full authority is that it's generally the full authority that would have the authority, so to speak, to to act on or and respond to the petition. So although it may go up to uh, one of its standing committees, it, the, it's it's likely that the nature of the petition will be something that would need a, a position uh, for the response to come from the full authority. I just wanted assurance that that had been considered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ross. Uh, Councillor Brooks. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me OK? Yes, Councillor. I think I was squeaking earlier, and that's not like me. Um, Chairman, I understand that these standing orders are for a pre-COVID world and probably a post-COVID world, but I'm not sure they'll work in a COVID world. If you look at page 47 to the bottom, standing order 12, Every member of the authority attending a meeting of the authority shall sign his or her name in the attendance book or sheet provided for that purpose. Did they consider the world we're in at the moment in terms of standing orders? Because clearly that is one indicator of how we could not satisfy standing orders. I suspect there are others. So I accept that they're fit for purpose in a non-COVID world, but not at the moment. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Graham, would you like to take that? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, the, these uh, procedural standing orders have, have had a long gestation in terms of the process in uh, working through the amendments. Uh, so that I think it probably date back until uh, January, the January of this year, and perhaps even December of the preceding year. But the, the point is well made that these uh, standing orders are in the contemplation of, of physical meetings. Uh, as members may be aware, um, regulate, the COVID regulations that relate to meetings um, specifically suspend uh, the, the typical standing orders of all local authorities, including councils and, and fire and rescue authorities, so that they are in abeyance until um, I think the 31st of March 2021. So um, should uh, the restrictions on on physical meetings continue beyond then it's likely that the government will uh, ex create new new regulations so that any um, standing orders that are built around meetings taking place uh, in in physical um, circumstances will be will, will continue to be superseded so to, to the answer to your question is no they weren't no none of men, none of these amendments uh, are aimed at uh, remote meetings, but the, 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 the legislation that's in place um, override any reference to uh, any uh, provision in standing orders that relate to physical meetings. Um, that's a, a long way of answering that question, but I, I hope that I, um, you take the points. Helpful. Thank you, Graham. Chairman, Councillor Hillier Simons would like to ask a question. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, it's in Appendix D, page 17, or page 1 in the main agenda papers, right at the bottom, SO105, inspection of lands, premises, etc. It's, I'd, I'd like some clarification because I think it says what it's not meant to say. It may just be a punctuation thing or a word or two that needs to be added, but what it actually says is no member of the authority shall issue any order respecting any works which are being carried out by behalf of the authority, nor claim by virtue of their membership of the authority any right to inspect or to enter upon any fire stations, land or premises which the authority has the power or duty to enter or which are owned by the authority. What it's actually saying is that uh, no member of the authority has the right to enter any fire station, land or premises. And of course, we can do. Um, I assume that it, it's meant in the context of issuing any order. 
but it, it does need to be rejigged a little bit, otherwise it uh, prevents us from going into any fire stations. Graham? Does that make sense, Graham? Yep, I'm, I'm just looking very carefully uh, to see if there is um, there is a, uh, a punctuation error, because the intention really is in respect of... Uh, Let's have a look. Works being carried out on behalf of yes. the authority. That's all. Well, that's how I understood it. Yeah. As it's written, it's a bit yeah, ambiguous. So, so it Just probably needs really another well. word or two put in, rather than a punctuation change. Okay. Shall we? We take that away, and uh, yeah, well, sure. if, if that, with your leave permission, that, leave yeah, with your permission, if what what I'll do is um, uh, and with. With Councillor Mackenzie Penzi Boyle's permission, um, we'll say agree the proposed amendments to sections of the members' handbook listed in the report, uh, with the exception of perhaps if you'd like to remind me which section it was, Councillor Lydia Simons. Um, it was S of one hundred and five, Inspector of Lands, Premises, etc., on page seventeen. S O one hundred and five. Okay. Thank you for that proposal, Chairman. Okay, thank you. And it could, and it could be um, that uh, with with, they, with that they're approved subject um, to section to SO one hundred and five to be approved uh, by myself in consultation with. Um, sure. Uh, yep, that uh, makes sense. Yeah, if you're doing, in doing consultation with the chair of audit and governance, I think yeah. that would be the right way to go. Thank you. Thank Chairman. you. Well, well spotted, Vice Chair. Chairman, Councillor Werner would like to ask a question. Councillor Werner. Uh, thank you. I, I'm very happy with uh, Councillor Hillier Simon's point. Um, on the subject, I just want to check we're not making the Armed Forces champion an official um, role as yet until we know the consequences of doing that. I'm particularly concerned that if there was a special responsibility attached to um, to making the role official, then that would be sending out a bad message to the firefighters and the public. Um, um, so can I just have clarification on that, please? So I'll, I'll certainly give the clarification that any changes to special responsibility allowances would come back to the fire authority for your um, for your view. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think we're looking to make it an official paid post at this moment in time. Um, but of course, you know, uh, that, that would have to be a decision of the fire authority and you would be, be able to have oversight on that if indeed that was the decision. But that's not my intention at the moment. OK, thank you very much, Chairman. It looks like there are no other questions, Chairman. Okay, in that case, um, I understand that uh, Councillor Helia Simons would like to move the officer's recommendation. Councillor Helia Simons, if I just remind you of the amendment to 2.1 um, on SO105 to be clarified. Yep, I'm happy to move that with those exceptions, Chairman. Sorry, not kind of silly as I'm I beg your pardon. It's it's okay. actually Councillor Mackenzie Boyle. Yeah, no, sorry, I'll Councillor Mackenzie. Yeah, all right, no, Councillor Mackenzie Boyle. All you all you lovely members with your double barreled names. I get it's not double barreled names. I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, Councillor yes. Mackenzie Boyle. Yeah. Like well to... thank you. Yeah, th th thank you, uh, Councillor Helia Simons there. Anyway, thank you, Chairman. I'm pleased that the members' handbook is reviewed uh, regularly and it is important that we do remain compliant. So I thank you for those points raised tonight. So therefore it's great pleasure that I move the recommendations set out in the report tonight, page 23, 21 to 24, with the proposed recommendations. Councillor Linden, I believe you wish to second those recommendations. So can you please unmute and confirm? Uh, I do confirm, Chairman. I'd like to, with great pleasure, to second your motion. Thank you, Councillor Linden. Thank you very much indeed. So we have a, a seconded amended motion. Um, and uh, does any member wish to speak? Mm. 
no one else wishes to speak, Chairman. OK, well, I'd just like to put on record my thanks to um, the Audit and Governance Committee for the work that they've done. And Graham, you too, is our uh, monitoring officer. Thank you for the work that you've undertaken to go through this. Um, I'm sure that once we've done the amendment, this will be a very, very useful addition to uh, members' work and have a, an up-to-date members' handbook. So thank you very much indeed. Um, do we need to vote on this? I think we do because we are we agreeing these. Um, we can do it on silent assent. So any member that wishes to abstain or vote against this motion, if you can please put your video on now. No one wishes to vote against or abstain, Chairman. The motion is then carried. Thank you. OK, so we move on then to agenda item 13, uh, which is the Local Government Ethical Standards Committee, the uh, Ethical Standards Committee on Standards in Public Life. Again, Councillor Mackenzie Ball, would you like to introduce this item? I would, uh, Chairman. Thank you very much. As Chairman of the Audit and Governance Committee, I was pleased that the committee received this report at its meeting on the 3rd of November. It was comforting to, re to read from the audit undertaken by Faith Rowe how well the authorities' procedures already accord substantially with the best practice recommendations made by the committee on standards in public life. The Audit and Governance Committee endorsed the officer's recommendation, which I believe will position the authority well when further communications are received from the Committee on Standards in Public Life. Therefore, can I ask uh, Graham Britton, the monitoring office again, please to uh, present the report? Thank you, Chairman, members. The genesis of this report is the letter to chief executives of all local authorities published in July 2020 from the Committee on Standards in Public Life about its report on local government ethical standards, which it published in January 2019. A copy of the letter is at page 85 in the agenda pack. The report made 26 recommendations, mostly aimed at government requesting changes to legislation, and one aimed at the Local Government Association to create a new model draft code of conduct after consultation with councils. And I understand that the LGA has held over the summer months what it was calling online roadshows through, uh, through Zoom in which members of this authority may have participated through their appointing councils. The Local Government Association has stated that it is due to report on its final model, model code of conduct later this calendar year. The Committee on Standards in Public Life report also includes 15 best practice recommendations as its July letter states. And it states that, that uh, it would expect all local authorities to implement these recommendations. The 15 best practice recommendations are at pages 86 and 87 in the agenda pack. In its letter, the Committee on Standards in Public Life states that it will be writing to local authorities again in the autumn to ascertain progress against its 15 best practice recommendations. With this in mind, Faith Row has undertaken an audit of Royal Berkshire's current arrangements, benchmarked against the 13 recommendations applicable to combined fire and rescue authorities. The findings of the audit are at pages 89 to 91 of the agenda pack. There was nothing in the findings which gave me cause for concern. However, there are some aspects of the recommendations which I invited the Audit and Gover Governance Committee to bring to the authority this evening to agree. The substantive recommendations for the authority to agree are set out on pages 81 and 82 of the agenda pack, starting at recommendation 2.2. The first recommendation, 2.2.1, is that it should agree to the code of conduct being reviewed on an annual basis in line with the Committee on Standard in Pub Standards in Public Life's recommendations, but, there, that, but that this should wait until 21.22, so as not to preempt the content of the new model LGA code of conduct. Therefore, recommendations, sorry, therefore, recommendation treble 2.1, that the outcomes of the LGA's consultation on its draft code of conduct be taken into account when Royal Berkshire's review is undertaken. Recommendation treble 2.2 is that when the code of conduct is reviewed, the prohibition on harassment be added to the prohibition on bullying. 
and, and that as per recommendation treble 2.3, definitions and examples of both bullying and harassment be included. Recommendation treble 2.4 and treble 2.5 also derive from the best practice recommendations as do the recommendations under 2.2.3. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, Chairman. Thank you, Graham. Members, if you have any questions, if you can please turn your video on. There are no questions, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no questions, I will uh, ask Councillor Mackenzie Ball if she wishes to move the item. No chairman. Sorry, no chairman. Back to you, sir. Okay, thank you. We well, have two recommendations set out in the report tonight uh, at 2.1 and 2.2, um, and their subsequent uh, paragraphs under those. Um, I'd like to propose these recommendations. Um, Councillor Stanford Bill, I believe you wish to second the recommendation. Uh, can you please unmute and confirm? Yes, I'd yes, like I'm to second this motion, please. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, does any member wish to speak? If you can turn your video on. No one wishes to speak, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. There's no member has wished to speak for or against this. I will just ask if any member wishes to vote against or abstain, if you could just let us know by switching your video on now. No one wishes to vote against or abstain, Chairman. Then the motions are carried by silent assent. Thank you very much indeed. Agenda item 14 is amendments to contract and financial regulations. Uh, please can I ask Councillor Mackenzie Boyle to introduce this report. Once again, thank you, Chairman. The updated contract of finance regulations that are attached as appendices to this paper have been scrutinised by the Audit and Governance Committee. The committee believes that the proposed amendments further strengthen controls and will ensure that the authority continues to obtain value for money from its contractual arrangements. The committee therefore recommends that the fire authority approve both sets of regulations and I'll now hand over to Connor to provide some more detail on those changes. Connor, thank you. Thank you very much um, for the introduction. So the, the current regulations were approved by fire authority in October 2017 and it is good practice to review and update update these regulations on a regular basis. So the amendments set out um, in the report fall into two categories. Um, firstly, strengthening the effectiveness of our internal controls, and secondly, increasing the efficiency of our processes wherever possible. The changes in both of these areas are set out in the report and incorporated into the draft regulations that are attached as appendices. Um, rather than go through all of the changes, I would like to focus on the three main areas uh, where controls have been strengthened. The first significant change um, relates to the authorization of contracts above £1 million. Currently, Management Committee needs to approve contracts over £1 million, with approval being sought once the outcome of the tendering process is known. This can lead to delays in awarding contracts and can prove problematic when the authority enters into collaborative procurements. It also means the management committee is getting sight of these high value procurements very late on in the process. In order to make them the role of management committee more effective and improve the efficiency of the process, it is proposed to change um, the process so that tenders for contracts over one million pounds require a business case to be approved by management committee before the tender process commences. A tender price of up to 5% more than the business case can be accepted by officers if budget provision exists. If the final tender award is between 5 and 10% greater than the business case figure, agreement has to be sought from the chair of the fire authority before awarding. 
and any variance greater than 10% would need the approval of management committee. The second change relates to the disposal of land and buildings. Given that the authority is about to embark on the sale of several properties, it is important that the process around such sales are robust and transparent. To this end, once management committee has made a decision to sell a property, there is a new requirement for the three statutory offices to approve and oversee any process for its disposal. The final change relates to debt write-offs. The changes are twofold. Firstly, to strengthen the controls around write-offs by requiring the three statutory officers to agree higher level write-offs rather than just the chief fire officer. Having strengthened the controls around write-offs, the new regulation provides for a bit more flexibility. The current regulation states that the chief finance officer in conjunction with the monitoring officer has delegated authority to write off debts up to £5,000 and debt write-offs up to £10,000 can be authorised by the chief fire officer. It is proposed to change this to allow the chief fire officer stroke chief executive in consultation with the chief fi finance officer to write off debts of up to 0.05% of the annual authority revenue budget. Debt write-offs from 0.05% to 0.1% of the revenue budget can only be authorised by the three statutory officers. All write-offs must be logged and will be subject to scrutiny by both internal and external audit. Debt write-offs above those levels must be approved by management committee. I believe that the three changes that I've just described, together with procedural changes outlined in the report, will strengthen internal controls and improve the efficiency of our processes. As a final point, it is possible that there could be some changes to terminology in relation to public procurement regulations once the transition period with the EU comes to an end on the 31st of December. Therefore, this paper also proposes that the fire authority delegates authority to the chief finance officer to make changes of a technical nature to the authority's contract regulations so that they remain aligned to legislation from the 1st of January 2021. I'm happy to take any questions, Chairman. Thank you, Connor. Members, do you have any questions? If you have, can you please put your camera on now? There are no questions, Chairman. Apologies, Chairman. Councillor Bateson would like to ask a question. Okay, Councillor Bateson. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to just go a bit further um, on this um, debt um, write-off. Um, you Do we get a lot of write-offs? You have said as a percentage, but um, um, that doesn't really tell us that much. And how much money do we lose through this? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, we have very few um, debt write-offs. Um, we don't have uh, a lot of income that we receive um, in terms of fees and charges. Um, so debt write-offs are very rare for, for the authority and they tend to be in the area of um, pensions. Um, so um, to date, uh, any uh, major write-offs that we've had have come through to um, management committee and have been dealt with by um, members in terms of deciding uh, the appropriate um, form of action. So the proposals here wouldn't have changed any of those um, decisions that were made uh, previously in terms of whether or not they went to management committee. Um, and uh, to be honest, I, I, I believe that unless um, particular um, issue is clear cut, then um, I, I would expect that um, members to be involved at the start in terms of any decisions around um, write-offs. Um, in terms of those amounts, um, the 0.05% um, is about £17,000 and 0.1% is £35,000. So um, I believe for those higher levels of, of debt write-offs, um, we're talking about the involvement of um, the three statutory officers and they would, um, you, you would, we would need uh, unan unanimity um, amongst those three statutory officers um, for any write-offs to go ahead. 
um, those write-offs then, as I've said, would then be um, subject to scrutiny by both internal and external auditors. So in terms of the internal auditors, every year we have a core financial controls audit um, with, which looks at the um, controls and uh, how we're applying the financial regulations. Um, so uh, debt write-offs would be looked at in that regard. In terms of the external auditors, um, as part of their audit of the statement of accounts, they look at best value. And again, they would be interested in um, debt write-offs to ensure that uh, the authority was getting best value um, in terms of um, the money that it uses um, from the public. Um, so I believe there are a lot of um, strong controls in there, stronger than we've had in the past. Um, and uh, from my perspective, um, it is um, most important that we do have those links through as well with the internal auditors and external auditors who then report into the Audit and Governance Committee on a quarterly basis. Thank you, Connor. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Councillor Bateson. Are there any other questions from members? Chairman, Councillor Bennyworth, I'd like to ask a question. Councillor Bennyworth, we. We're struggling okay. to Councillor, Councillor Bennyworth, do you have a question? Chairman, I've just uh, spoken to you. Uh, I'm going to stop this evening. Um, I'm, I'm going to lose you for about uh, 15 minutes or so, but I'll, I'll be doing it as quick as I can. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from members? Uh, there are no further questions, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, the recommendations are set out in the report tonight at paragraphs 2.1 and 2.4. I would like to propose these recommendations. Uh, Councillor Stanford Bill, I believe you wish to second the recommendation. Please, can you unmute and confirm? Uh, confirm. I'd like to second this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask if any other member would like to speak? No one else wishes to speak, Chairman. Oh, apologies, Councillor Ross, Chairman. Councillor Ross. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, many contracts uh, do come within my strategic asset portfolio, and especially the upcoming asset sales of properties. So I am very reassured that we will have the updated regulations in place as we move forward on the sale of these properties and also the procurement of vehicles. Uh, just separately, I think it's good for the management committee to have early sight of these contracts, but then to leave matters to the professional officers. But of course, best that the lead member and yourself as chairman are kept in the picture. But uh, I do support um, what has come forward this evening. Thank you, Councillor Ross. If, if any other member wish to speak? No one else wishes to speak, Chairman. Thank you. I therefore move the recommendation. If any member would like to abstain or vote against, if you could please turn your videos on now. No one wishes to vote against. I abstain, Chairman. The motion is therefore carried by silent assent. Uh, members, the, the members, the, the, the meeting this evening has gone on rather longer than I expected, and I think that we've been online for the best part of an hour and a half now. I'm going to propose that we move uh, forward uh, the short adjournment uh, just for a comfort break for everybody. Um, so I'm now going to move that we post adjourn the meeting uh, for five minutes uh, just for you to have a comfort break, and uh, we'll see you all at it is now four minutes past eight let's say we'll see you all again at eight ten thank you
Uh, the meeting will resume in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Thank you very much, James. I um, hope you're all refreshed. Uh, we now move on to agenda item 14, which is amendments to contracts and financial regulations. Oh, uh, no, I've just done that. But I Sorry about that, see? We move on to agenda item 15, which is the annual Treasury Management Review. Um, and uh, this is the, the mid-year Treasury Management Update. Uh, please can I ask Connor to please present the item. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there are two Treasury Management Reports um, to note, um, as just been said. First is the annual Treasury Report for 2019-20 and um, the second is the mid-year update for the current year. So the Treasury report for 1920 is attached as Appendix A. It's um, fairly straightforward as a report, um, given that we don't use complex financial instruments um, that do involve heightened levels of risk. So the report confirms that the actual performance um, complied with the prudential indicators that were approved by the FAR Authority in February 2019. No additional borrowing was undertaken in 1920, and the authority received £117,000 in investment income. In terms of the um, current year update, um, as expected, there are significant cash outflows relating to um, approved capital projects. Um, this, together with the cuts in the bank rate to 0.1%, means that investment income for the year is expected to be around £22,000. Later this year, the authority will be repaying a £1.75 million loan to the PWLB. Um, it was anticipated that the authority would take out new loans amounting to £3.6 million. However, due to COVID, there has been some slippage and reprofiling of stage payments in relation to capital projects. On this basis, it's currently estimated that new borrowings at the end of the financial year will only be £1.25 million. I'm um, happy to take any questions, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Members, if anybody has a question, if you could please put your video on now. There are no questions, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Howe, I understand that you would like to move this recommendation over to you. Thank you, Chair. The recommendations are set out in the report that are laid there in 2.1 and 2.2, and I propose that they be accepted. Thank you, Councillor Howe. I would like to happy to second the recommendations. Therefore, please can I ask any other members who wish to speak to switch their videos on now. No one else wishes to speak, Chairman. Thank you. Um, therefore, as nobody has wished to speak for or against this, um, can I please ask that any members that wish to vote against or abstain from the recommendations as set out by Councillor Howe, please put your videos on now. No one wishes to vote against or abstain, Chairman. Thank you. The motion is therefore carried. We move on then to agenda item 16, which is annual report on governance. This next item uh, will be uh, removed by Councillor, but will be moved by me, but uh, I understand Councillor Mackenzie Boyle as Chairman of Audit and Governance would like to say a few words first. I would, Chairman. Um, I have put on my um, video and I, ah, here we are little bit longer than 10 seconds, sorry. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thanks for the op this opportunity. This is my first annual report as Chairman of uh, Governance, Audit and Governance Committee for the Municipal Year 2019-2020. This report originally scheduled to be presented to the Fire Authority in June 2020. However, it was subs subsequently moved to the cancellation of the Audit and Governance Committee in March in response to the government lockdown measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. 
The key details of the report are shown in section three. Please, therefore, can I ask Katie Mills, Head of Corporate Services, to present the report. Thank you. In addition to Councillor Mackenzie Boyle's report, as Chairman of the Audit and Governance Committee, the report also contains a summary of members' allowances for the period June 2019 to May 2020. In addition to this, the attendance of Fire Authority members for the 2019-20 municipal year is attached to Appendix B. And tonight, members are asked to note the annual report on governance and its associated appendices and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Members, do you have any questions? You can put your videos on. Give me notification. There are no questions, Chairman. OK, as there are no questions, I will move the annual report and governance. Um, and I would like to uh, propose these recommendations. Councillor Bateson, I wish I believe that you wish to second these recommendations. Please, can you unmute and confirm? Yes, I would second. Thank you. Can I ask any other member that wishes to speak to turn their videos on? No one else wishes to speak, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Um, as nobody has spoken against this, if any member wishes to abstain or vote against these recommendations, can you let me know by switching your video on, please? No one wishes to vote against or abstain, Chairman. The motion is therefore carried. Thank you. Agenda item 17 is lead members six month update reports. Uh, members, I'd like to say by start by thanking these members that have submitted these reports and um, very comprehensive updates. And on that basis, I propose that we take these reports as read and move straight to questions. Can I ask that any other member wishing to ask a question to switch their video on now? No one wishes to ask a question, Chairman. Thank you. As there are no further questions, I'll move us on to the recommendation and propose that we note the reports. Vice Chairman, I understand that you wish to second the recommendation. Please, can you unmute and confirm? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Vice Chair. And please, can I ask any other member who wishes to speak to switch their video on now, please? No one wishes to speak, Chairman. Thank you. Well, I'd like to add my thanks to all of the lead members for the, the work that they've done during this extremely trying time um, during these COVID-19 um, unusual times. I nearly used the word that I promise I wouldn't use. Um, and, uh, and, and really and truly, we really could not um, run such an efficient fire authority without the lead members' hard work. So thank you very much indeed. Um, can I ask any member that wishes to vote against the recommendation or abstain? Can you put your video on now? No one wishes to vote against or abstain, Chairman. Therefore, these reports are noted. Thank you. Agenda item 18 is the Thames Valley Fire Control Service six month update report. Please can I ask Jim Powell, Area Manager, Collaboration, Change and Finance, to present the paper. Jim. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Uh, this report complements the previous agenda item and presents the six month update for the Thames Valley Fire Control Service. As described in the paper, TVFCS reached the significant milestone of being operational for five years in April this year. Unfortunately, planned celebrations have been curtailed as like every other every area of the service, the impact of COVID has been felt in con the control room as well. However, thanks to early and detailed preparation and planning, Minimum crewing levels have been maintained throughout the first six months of this year. The coming period will require further planning to manage some key activity over the next 12 to 18 months, which is outlined in sections 310 to 312 of the report. And this will be a focus of the a TVFCS Joint Committee Workshop in March next year. Chairman, that concludes a brief summary of the report and I'm happy to take any questions. 
Thank you very much indeed, Jim. Uh, Councillors Ross and Councillors Cannon, as our representatives on the Thames Valley Fire Control Joint Committee, is there anything else you wish to add? Chairman, Councillor Ross would like to say something. Councillor Ross. Thank you, Chairman. It's only really just to, uh, to, to endorse what uh, Jim has given us. Um, it's been obviously a very trying period for TVFCS, um, <clears throat> and I think they've come through it magnificently and, and kept themselves uh, well to themselves, so, so they haven't been affected. Um, it was a shame we missed the five-year celebration. I look forward to a proper celebration of the five years, even if by then it's six years. Um, but uh, there's lots of work coming up. Uh, we're coming near to the end of the contract, so you will be hearing more about uh, what what is on the horizon. Uh, but as a review, uh, I do uh, recommend this to the Fire Authority. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Ross. Uh, Councillor Cannon, Chairman, would like to speak. Councillor Cannon. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to uh, support what uh, Councillor Ross has said, but also thank Jim and his colleagues across all three uh, fire services for their work in overseeing the fire control centre and to the staff involved who have actually kept this essential service running through very, very difficult times. And I think it's their dedication uh, and of their management that needs to be noted uh, and hopefully to continue moving forward. But I would li like to thank uh, personally, and I would hope the Fire Authority itself would thank Jim, his colleagues, and more importantly, the staff there for their excellent job in keeping this, the, the service going throughout these difficult times. Thank you. Thank you, you Councillor Cannon. Uh, can I ask any other member wish to ask a question on this report? You can put your video on, please. Uh, Chairman, Councillor Brooks would like to ask a question. Councillor Brooks. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think I recall I asked a question of the activity levels during lockdown during the first two quarters. I seem to recall the Chief telling me that actually there wasn't a lot of downturn in them. But I note on 3.7, it specifically says there's been a reduction in the volume and nature of calls received over the first two quarters of 2021. Now, I do understand this is more than one uh, brigade and service, but am I getting the wrong end of the stick somewhere? Because I did think in lockdown, shouts would have gone down. Chair, Chief. Chair. Yes, Councillor, uh, thank you. Yes, we did have a discussion earlier in relation to the overall volume of calls. Um, we did give a breakdown at the last management committee on the specific details across areas. And whilst we've seen some reduction, they are broadly similar. Uh, there are some reduction in some areas, such as RTC, but not very significant. Uh, and we can get the member the details that we provided in relation to those specific breakdowns. If that would be helpful. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you for the question, Councillor Brooks. Uh, does any other member wish to ask a question? There are no other questions, Chairman. Okay, thank you, members. We've been asked to note the contents of the report, which I would like to propose. Um, Councillor Ross, I believe that you would like to second the recommendation. Can you please unmute and confirm? I confirm I'd like to uh, second that uh, report. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Ross. Can I ask any other member who wishes to speak to switch their videos on now, please? No one else wishes to speak, Chairman. Thank you, members. Therefore, we're going to put it in the vote to note the report. Can I ask anybody that wishes to vote against the recommendation or abstain from the vote? Switch your videos on now, please. No one wishes to vote against or abstain, Chairman. Thank you. The motion is therefore carried. Agenda item 19 is the forward plan. Can I ask any member wishing to ask a question to switch their video on? There are no questions, Chairman. 
Thank you. We're being asked to note the forward plan, which I propose we do. If any member does not agree with the proposal, please can you switch your video on now? No one wishes to vote against or abstain, Chairman. Thank you, members. The forward plan has been noted. Agenda item 20 is minutes of the standing committees. Members are asked to note the minutes, which I propose we do. If any member does not agree with the proposal, please can you switch your video on now? No one wishes to vote against or abstain, Chairman. Thank you. The minutes of the standing committees are therefore noted. Agenda item 21 is the date of the next meeting, which is Wednesday the 17th of February 2021. The venue will be confirmed nearer the time and based on COVID-19 restrictions in a place uh, decided at that time. I sincerely hope, of course, that we could be able to meet uh, physically, but uh, we'll take that view. Uh, does anybody wish to say anything about this? Uh, Chairman, Councillor Lovelock has something to say, I think. Councillor Lovelock, you wish to say something about the date of the next meeting? The 14th of February, but uh, I'm just conscious that possibly not all the local authorities will have made their budgets. No, I think it's probably about the date to the last. Yeah, I, I think that uh, you were breaking up a little bit there, Councillor Lovelock, but I think we got the gist no, of that. Sorry. Uh, Connor, did you get the gist of that? And can you answer? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, in, in terms of the inform. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can yep. hear you. Okay, great. Um, yes, in terms of the um, information that we get from the unit trees, um, we're supposed to have that by the end of January, um, which would then allow us um, to set our budget um, on that date in February. Um, in the past, we have had some difficulty getting those um, figures by that date. And in some cases, they, um, although we've received the figures, they have subsequently changed. Um, obviously, this year is um, uh, going to be a, a very challenging one for the unitaries. Um, but at the moment, um, those, those statutory dates are there at the end of, of January um, in terms of the information that they need to provide to us around um, council tax and business rates information. Councillor Lovelock, I think that, that may answer your question. And I agree with you that it may well be a moving feast. Um, uh, at that time, but um, to, we we have to set a date for the next meeting at at this fire authority meeting. At that time, that's the date we've set. Is is that does that meet your requirements? Yes, I, I'm yeah, I'm happy with that. Although I'd be amazed if that <laughs> it's a very complicated situation again. But yes, uh, I completely agree with you. And and as our financial officer said, it may be a very difficult year for the for for the um, unitary authorities. I think it might be a difficult year for us too, um, but we, you know, we, we'll wait and see. And does any other member wish to speak? No one else wishes to speak, Chairman. The date of the next meeting, unless otherwise noted, is February 17th, 2021. Mm -hmm. Thank you, members. That now concludes our remote fire authority meeting. Thank you for your time and patience. I declare this meeting closed. If you could stay on the line, I would appreciate it. Thank you.